the Apostle Paul was put into a very awkward position by the Corinthian church. It seems like we're, we're adding some conjecture here, like we're, we're kind of putting the pieces together. But what it seems is that he had been getting reports that there were not only false teachers coming into the church in Corinth and preaching somehow a different Jesus is kind of the description, a different spirit and another gospel, like some other form of who Jesus was. Some, something else was being taught entirely. And the people in Corinth were accepting this. They were hearing this teaching. There was something about it that was interesting to them, and they were accepting this false teaching. And Paul's getting these reports. But it wasn't just that. That was bad enough. But what made it awkward for Paul is that these teachers were also propping themselves up as super apostles. There were the apostles, and then there's the super apostles. And this is what it was going on in, in this church, but not just this church, but others. And so there's an idea that these people were saying, uh, the, the original apostles were cool, but we are better and cooler and more gifted and more relevant than the originals, or something like that was going on. And so Paul feels compelled in the, the second letter he writes to the Corinthians that we have, um, that he feels compelled to defend himself, even though he doesn't want to, and to remind them of his very real credentials in order to bring them back to the true gospel of Jesus and to the work that the Holy Spirit had done in them and, that, uh, and to remind them of what was really true. We read about that uh, specifically in 2 Corinthians uh, 11 and throughout there. And it tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, he tells us that he's been put through the ringer in order to preach about Jesus. And he has the, like the physical scars to prove it. And more than all of the things that has happened to him, how many times he's been beaten, how many times he's been in prison, how many times he's been shipwrecked, all of those kinds of things, even more than that, he says he carries a burden of caring for all the churches. So he's got all of these things to prove out that he really is a legitimate apostle. And then he continues in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 with a description of a spiritual experience that, uh, that gives him uh, his, apo his uh, apostleship or the authority to speak to them and to teach them. It gives his apostleship authenticity, and he talks about it here. So let's read it together, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 7. And see what he says. I've just set the context up for you so you'll understand what, what he's defending. And you'll see... Um, You'll see in chapter 11, if you just scroll back, kind of what I was just talking about there. Let's jump, jump into verse 1 of chapter 12, 2 Corinthians. He says this, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I say or do. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations. So he says, I must go on boasting. It's sort of like a back and forth here. You can see he doesn't really want to do this. He doesn't really want to say this, but he feels like he needs to. And he's convinced that there's nothing to be gained by boasting. It's like not, like it's not something he, he wants to do, but he recognizes that in the present situation that is happening in the Corinthian church, there is a lot that could be lost if he doesn't explain a couple of things to them. His opposition had an agenda against him. Um, it, it had been believed by those who he had led to faith in that city. And now he had to respond. And he says, although there's nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. And it's interesting, uh, when he, he talks about this experience he had in the spiritual, uh, Paul uses the third person. Did you notice that? He's not talking about somebody else. He's still talking about himself. But he's using the third person to describe his experience. Um, and I, and I, I wonder why... Scholars think maybe it was because he, it's like he doesn't want that to become like I've had all of these amazing experiences, that's who I am. He kind of wants to look at these things that have happened to him in his spiritual life with a wonderment and an, like a detached wondering. It's like this is an incredible thing that has happened, but not because of me, but because of Christ. And also, um, 
He doesn't spill all the tea about the inexpressible things either. He doesn't say, and then the Lord said, and then he said, and then you won't even believe what he said. He just basically says, it's inexpressible things. It doesn't matter what he said to me. That's not the important part of this. I don't need to prove to you I'm spiritually elite by telling you these things. I'm just explaining what happened. He just tries to keep it as simple as possible and in just a couple of verses. Just basically to show them he's not inferior to anyone who is claiming to have had a supernatural experience. He's saying, yeah, I have also had an incredible supernatural experience. I have met the Lord. I have seen Jesus. It's pretty amazing. It's it's not, like, that's not the thing. He says, so he says all of this. He sets this whole thing up, and he says, this needs to be said. It needs to be said that I have the credentials to be an apostle. I have the credentials to have given you the true gospel, to have introduced you to Christ. But there is something else here that you also need to know. Let's keep reading in 2 Corinthians 12. We'll just do the second half of verse 7 to the end of this section. He says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I mean, that's a statement. So here is this guy with incredible credentials, his background, his training, you can go back in in the letters and read about that, his spiritual experiences, which he's just described a little bit of for his readers, his sacrifices for the gospel, his effectiveness in evangelism. He is essentially as strong as as you could be as a person. He He checks all the boxes. He is as strong as a person could be if we're just checking boxes. But God has allowed something in his life that none of those credentials could touch. When this uh, thorn in the flesh showed up, none of that stuff mattered. He was brought low. And there is this guy who had every reason to say, like everybody would have thought he was the strongest person, strongest Christian, strongest everything you could think of. He's pleading with God for relief and release. The thorn in the flesh, you maybe heard that phrase before. We, we kind of use it. Uh, maybe, we, maybe you've described a person as that. Please don't do that. Don't, don't do that. They're a thorn in your thorn in your flesh. A thorn is something that frustrates or causes trouble. And there are a, a lot, there's a lot of speculation from scholars about what Paul was referring to when he talked about uh, this thorn for him. There's three big categories that it falls into. The first one is that Paul had a physical ailment of some kind, maybe even an eye disease, or maybe as a reference to something like that in Galatians 4. Or he had some kind of a speech impediment, which would be a huge issue since he was declaring, preaching the gospel all the time. The second idea that scholars have come up with is that um, he's talking about the continuing opposition from the churches. Maybe it is in in the form of a particular person or a particular group who consistently come against the message of the true gospel that he's been preaching. That's the thorn that he's talking about. Or the third third category uh, would be something along the lines of Paul pointing to demonic activity in his life, some kind of a severe temptation or something that just keeps coming up and hammering away at him. And I think that the fact that he simply calls it a thorn in his flesh is one of those omissions in the Bible that's there for our benefit, actually. Because if we knew exactly what that thorn was, we would just get fixated on, well, that's not happened to me, so this doesn't apply to me. But you can see how this this, this becomes uh, something that we can all relate to in some way, shape, or form because we don't know what it is. We get fixated when we hear stories about the what, like the what was happening, the exact thing, but uh, we forget about the what now, and that's the point of this passage. Because it doesn't matter if Paul's eyes were the issue, it doesn't matter whether it was pain or demonic oppression or scathing criticism or anything else. For him and for us to be taught by this scripture, the what now then becomes the focus, not the, the what, not the circumstance itself. It's interesting that Paul doesn't get stuck either on the why. Why me, Lord? Why this? Why now? 
He's decided already the why. Did you notice that? How he, I don't know whether, uh, whether Paul had wrestled through this in prayer. For, I mean, we know he wrestled with God about this thorn and asked it to be removed. But the, his understanding of why God allowed it to stay, I, we don't know how long it took him to figure this out, whether the Lord gave him a revelation about it or he wrestled through it in some way, shape, or form. What we just know here in Scripture that is his conclusion of the matter is that it was obvious to him um, that he was open to being brought down by pride. Remember those credentials that we talked about. But he seemed to have accepted that, um, that this thorn was a fact, it was a reality, and it was being used to make sure that it, pride wouldn't take him down. And that's that. He, he sort of like has already settled it when, when he's writing to the church in Corinth. And so in the Old Testament and the New Testament, just to be clear, Satan has no power other than what God allows, uh, ever. So, and there are times, and think about the book of Job, if you, <laughs> we just went through that, uh, if you're reading the Bible in a year with us, right? You, you, this is such an interesting story. What God allows in someone's life, that's the only thing that Satan has power over. And we don't understand all the whys about that and all of that kind of thing, but we just know that that's true. And in this case, the thorn, or as Paul says, the thorn was a messenger of Satan, whatever that refers to, was allowed, God allowed this in his life to produce humility and to produce a, a deep dependence on God. And, and listen, Paul doesn't just go, like, have a, this, this thorn, this messenger of Satan in his life and go, oh, well, <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> this is hard. <laughs> like, that's not at all the sense. You hear that he's just, he's not just rolling over and giving up. He pleads with God. He wrestles with him for this thorn to be taken. And God answered his prayer by giving him the strength to bear it, not by relieving the problem. <laughs> but that's how God works sometimes, isn't it? He doesn't spare us from every difficult thing, not by a long shot. He does absolutely, however, make us able to conquer them. So here's the mixed message I want to talk about this morning. The culture says to us, you are stronger than you think. Look at all you've come from. Look what you've accomplished. You've got this. Or there is strength in you that you don't even know yet, and you will find it. Or this is one I really love. This one sounds really spiritual, by the way. Don't worry. God doesn't give you more than you can handle. Yeah, he does. <laughs> you already know what the mixed message is. Uh, or this is a really horrible one. If, I don't know if you've, ever, if you've ever said this to somebody in the past. Just walk in forgiveness and grace. Please don't ever do it again, okay? God gives his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers. <laughs> Off campus, everyone in the room is just going, Ew, gross, it's gross. Uh, but it, we, we mean these things to be very inspirational. We want to encourage people. And so I'm not trying to poo-poo that entirely, but that's the, the message of the culture says to us, you are stronger than you think. You've got this. You can just, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which is, by the way, physically impossible. You can't actually do that. But here's what the Bible says. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Yeah. And it says in Colossians 1.11 that you will be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, that you may have great endurance and patience. That's what the empowering of God does. In other words, friends, listen, you are not stronger than you think. I'm sorry. I'm not actually sorry. <laughs> But God's strength in you is far stronger than you can imagine. That's why I'm not actually sorry. Because I promise you it's better, and we're, we're going to talk about that now. I don't know if that idea encourages you or discourages you, that you are not stronger than you think. On one hand, that might be very um, deflating. If you were, especially if you were a high-achieving keener, uh, you live on the hope that you will be able to conquer that mountain if you work harder or you do more. Some of you just are wired that way. I love that about you. I love that. It's not true in this particular case, but I love that about you. I'm with you there. You feel like you'll be able to fix what is broken in your life. If you just apply, you can figure out, read the right book, go to the right seminar. If you just apply the right effort, and I'm telling you that you can't. 
You can be more organized or skinnier or healthier or smarter or a lot of other things by your own effort, but you will, in, and there are lots of great things you can do in your life and should do by applying effort and just leading your own life well, absolutely. But you will face a battle that you can't win in that kind of strength. And for you kind of non-type A folks out there, you might just feel like I told you that every suspicion you've ever had about yourself has been confirmed. See, you'll never be good enough and you can't do it. On the other hand, can I just invite you to see something completely different than either one of those? You are not enough, friend. But Jesus is so much more than enough. And that's what you're invited to. I don't care what kind of personality type you have. And I need you to hear me. This is not a platitude. This is not a cliche. This is the really, really real truth of the matter. I have lived it and I know it and I'm telling you that I know, that I know, that I know, that I know that it's true, that I am not enough, but Jesus in me is more than enough. And admittedly, over the last, until probably the last couple of years, I thought I understood this, but I didn't really. Sometimes life just needs to teach you a few things along the way. Absolutely in my life, I've known the Lord for many decades now. I can say that, <laughs> decades now. Jesus has brought me peace in difficult situations. He has given me wisdom for big decisions. He has provided for needs. Like, I have seen him move in my life, and then the, in my family, and in my friends. Like, I have seen him move and work. That's why I have no problem walking confidently in faith in Christ, because he has just proved, oh, I could just sing a song. Do you know where I'm going with this? If my mom was here, she'd be like, I already know. Oh, how he has proved him o'er and o'er, right? Like, this is, this is my testimony. I know that he is able. I know that he will meet me. My weakness in my life has definitely allowed him to be shown strong. I've seen it again and again. I hope you've experienced the same. But what I didn't realize is that when you hit some things that are so deep that maybe you could describe it like a thorn in your flesh or like a messenger of Satan, this kind of torment, when there's just something that when you just have nothing else you can do with whatever's going on in your life but to plead with God for relief or release, then in those moments, I mean, you thought you knew how strong Jesus was. You find out how strong Jesus really can be. And that is the most beautiful thing about difficulties I am preaching to you about the joy of difficulties today, and I know it. I'm doing it with a smile on my face, and I actually mean it, I promise. The beautiful thing about difficulties is that you, you do have a chance to find out how incredible Jesus really is. I've said to a few people in the last little while, you know this stuff that I preach about, it actually works. <laughs> like it's really, really real. I've said it to a few of you, and you're like, yeah, you did that to me. It's actually really real. It matters. It works. The truth of the matter is this. We are stubborn and proud and rebellious. How many of you in this room just really love asking for help? Mm, isn't it your favorite when you're just like, I can't. I, like in any way, I mean, we're talking, like these, are, these are big, deep life things we're talking about, but even in the small things, I don't want to ask for help. I am five foot two. That's like hobbit sized almost. And when I go to the grocery store and something's on the top shelf and like Nate walks by, I still don't want to ask him to get it for me. You will actually see me if I'm at Costco. <laughs> The cheese is always so high, and I will literally climb into the cooler and get it myself rather than ask somebody for help. Like, this is how, maybe this is not everybody, but I suspect, I know you're not all five foot two, but like asking for help is just like, oh, I just, I just want to be able to do it myself. I just want to be self-sufficient. I just want to be able to do it without having to ask and to like, yeah, be beholden to somebody. I don't know what, I don't know what the issue is. We do not like to ask for help in any way, even in the small things, let alone in the big ones. Admitting that you're not okay is very uncomfortable. And we've convinced ourselves that if we say to anyone, let alone the Lord, that we're not okay, that somehow our faith isn't going to be able to sustain that. Or that we're going to receive a lot of judgment from other people. Hey, I have a quick question for you. If somebody came to you today and said, I just want you to know that I am going through one of the hardest things in my life and I'm not okay. How many of you would judge that person? Zero people, right? 
Yeah, of course not. Of course not. That's not. Of course that's not. But we've convinced ourselves that it's it's not okay to not be okay. It's not okay to admit to somebody or to the Lord when we're not really doing great. Or when we're talking about something like what Paul is describing, when there's just something in our lives that is beyond our capacity to be able to deal with. And so we convince ourselves that if we build walls around our pain, we'll be able to protect our hearts from hurting worse or hurting for longer. But instead of all of that, there's Jesus. Just saying to Paul and saying to you, I see you hear you. My grace is sufficient for you. And not just that, but my power is made perfect in weakness. Man, I want to be self-sufficient. I want to be powerful. I want to be able on my own to do whatever the thing is. But I'm not. (laughs) It's hard to admit it, but I'm not. I'm not. And struggling to try to prove that to myself is quite exhausting. Maybe you've been there. But what if I took down the walls uh, uh, that I built around my heart and I trusted him with it instead? Like like all of my heart, all of the pain, all of the grief, all of the anger, all of the bitterness, all of the trouble, all of the fear, all of the things, anything in the human experience that you could throw at that. What if I stopped trying to be enough on my own and I allowed his grace to be the center of my life, like for real? See, there's a, a strange message in the gospel That is, in fact, I hope not discouraging at all, but so deeply encouraging when you understand it, that when you face the worst that life can throw at you, the grace and power of God have the best chance to define your life. And I am so grateful for that because that's the life I want to live. I want to be the kind of person who walks in the grace and power of God because I know that I don't have enough on my own. I can't save myself. I can't fix myself. And I've, I've... I mean, I thought I, I, I admitted that to Jesus a long time ago when I became a Christian, but um, that was eight years old. I've, I've had to do that a lot more times, admit that a lot more times in the last couple of decades. Paul says it like this, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He says he's, he's boasting about his weaknesses. And not just that, he's delighting. I like that word, actually. He's delighting in them. Delight in the Greek here means to be content with, just deeply content with. I am delighting. What is he talking about? I just am so content in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Just so content in these things. That's what he's saying. It's like I'm so glad about this trouble because now in the trouble I'm facing right now, there is a perfect opportunity for Christ's power to rest on me and for him to be strong. And gosh, that's so much better than me trying to be strong. So I have a delightful contentment indeed. That's what he said here. He quit complaining about his thorn so that Christ's power may rest on him. One of the commentaries pointed out that this word rest uh, can be translated as to tabernacle, which doesn't mean a lot for us in our context in English. But it, that means like to, to pitch a tent. And it's likely that Paul is drawing on that Old Testament picture here, that imagery of the glory of God coming upon the tabernacle after they set up the tabernacle in Exodus 40. And he's saying he's learned to delight in his thorn because it actually brought the blessings of God on his life and invited God to pitch a tent or take up a residence in his life because of the hardship that he's going on, going through. Isn't that crazy? It's so delightful because what an opportunity for the, the Spirit of God to just indwell me, to rest on every part of my life because of this difficulty. That's the message here in 2 Corinthians. So the question for me is, I mean, I, I like the concept of it. The question for me is, how do, you, how do you learn to live like this? How do you learn to live as a follower of Christ who delights, is content with whatever comes your way in life? 
I want to be I want to be really cautious too because you understand that Paul has discerned that the thorn in his flesh is a messenger from Satan and he's also discerned that the Lord has said I'm going to leave it right there so that my grace would be shown to be sufficient for you so that in your weakness I would be able to be shown strong and he's he's or he settled that you understand that there are certain things that happen in your life and we've talked about this too so I want to you got to understand the discernment process here that sometimes things come into our lives and we say, mm-mm, no, not today, Satan. Like literally, okay? There are certain things that you can say, Lord, I, I, just, I just pray against such and such a thing. I, I, say, I say no to the temptation that is coming into my life. I say, I, I, you know, uh, we pray for healing and we declare that God has provided for healing through Christ and we know that these things to be true. And sometimes he heals us and sometimes he does not, right? So we understand that there's a discerning prayerful process here, but what we're talking about this morning is, are not the things that uh, we need to be praying against and, and really discerning that we need to take authority in the spirit against. We've talked a little bit about that a few weeks ago. What I'm talking about today are the things and the trials and difficulties in your life that you are pushing against, that you are grieving through, and you have not taken to the Lord. You haven't even asked him about them yet, and he hasn't had a chance to show you how strong he is yet because you haven't even told him about it. This is what we're talking about today. So how do you learn to live like this? Well, if we follow Paul's model here, there's a lot of things that we can pick up that will help us. And the first one is this, to humble yourself. Man, we can always start here. We could just literally always start here. In every spiritual transaction, we start by understanding who we are and who God is. We humble ourselves. Your credentials, your strength, whatever is in your life, whatever you've gone through before, or whatever victories you've had before, it doesn't matter how awesome you are, and you are awesome, I love you, you're amazing. But it's nothing compared to who Jesus is. It's just nothing compared to how incredible God is. And so we just recognize ourselves in that way. Humble yourself. The second thing is to reframe your struggle. This is kind of the way I'm describing what I see Paul doing here. Maybe there's a better way to describe it, but there's just like a sense where he stepped back uh, and, and considered what God may be allowing in his life. That's that discernment process I just mentioned. What God wants to do in this circumstance, what God is willing to allow in your life so that something might come out of it or something might happen through it, and you just try to take a step back instead of being in the, in the, just in the moment, you know, face down, looking at the ground, but you take a step back and say, wait, let me just reframe this struggle for a moment. What might the Lord want to say to me through it? I just need to understand it from a different perspective. The third one is this, pour out your heart to God. And this is, I mean... This is modeled everywhere in scripture. Paul talks about it very, like just briefly with a, with a sentence. He says he pled with God. He pled with God three times. God, I can't, I just can't, I can't do this. I can't, I can't. There's too many. God, do you, do you understand? I've been through, there's a lot. There's a, there's a lot. There's a lot going on. I have a lot and I cannot do this anymore. but he pleads with God. And so I would say this to you. I think the model here is just quite simple. It's not hyper-emotional or anything else. It says don't hide your pain. Take it and lay it at the feet of Jesus. Um, I had a great conversation with somebody about this recently who was really struggling with something, and I, and I, I, don't, I felt like the Holy Spirit prompted me to say this to, to her and uh, this is not the first time I've had this conversation with somebody about something like this. And I said, um, I'm so sorry for what you're going through. It was really hard. It's really, it is really hard. It's still hard. Have you, have you talked to Jesus about it? Well, no. I mean, I've asked people to pray for me. That's awesome. I love that. We will be happy to pray for you. But have you said to Jesus yourself in prayer, just like, you're like, hey, by the way, Lord, I just want you to know how I feel about what's going on right now. I'm so, I'm in so much pain. In this particular case, it was physical pain, which had created emotional pain and had created distrust for God and it had created all of these other things and none of that had been said to Jesus. It had been said to other people and it had been said, um, you, know, in, uh, you know, or asked for prayer and all of those kinds of things. But there was no moment where 
we actually go to Jesus and say, Jesus, let me pour out my heart to you. I'm going to tell you all the things that I'm feeling right now, all the things that I'm going through, and I want to hear from you. In fact, I need to hear from you. I need you to meet me in this place. I cannot do this on my own, and I will not leave this place until you speak to me. That's like the, the Jacob wrestling with God thing. And I'm telling you, church, I'm trying so hard not to scream at you. I love you guys. I'm telling you, this is missing in the church. We are so afraid that if we tell Jesus what is really happening in our hearts, that our faith will not stand against it. That we're afraid it's going to fall apart if we really say, God, I am mad at you because you have not come through for me the way that I thought you would. And it is the hardest thing I've ever gone through. And then your faith is going to fall apart. It's not. He's going to meet you in that place. Stop screaming. Go back to your notes. Pour out your heart to God. That's <laughs> the point of my story. I got to tell you, friends, I have this conversation. This was one recently, but listen, I have this conversation with people all the time, and this is what is missing. Do not be afraid of what he is going to say or not say. He will meet you. He will meet you. He will meet you. I don't know what he's going to say. I'll tell you what, I, last time I did this, I had a moment like Paul, and I was crying. And I was crying out to God, and I was like, and all the things, Jesus, <laughs> and all the things. I'll just leave it there. I said, all the things. And you know what Jesus said to me? He didn't say, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. Here's the three-point plan to fix it. Here's the whatever. Here's what's coming next. Here's what you can expect. None of that happened. You know what I felt like just quietly in my bedroom? He said to me, yeah, I know. I see you. I mean, and it was enough. It was enough because I knew he was working and I knew he could see me and it was enough. Church, can you hear me? You have to tell the Lord what is going on in your life. And that's the fourth one. Then in that moment, receive grace and strength from Christ. Don't hide your pain. Lay it at his feet and in those moments, trust him to meet you. I'm not saying trust him to fix everything that's going on in your life in that moment. I have very rarely seen that happen. That's just not how it works. But he will strengthen you and fill you. And can I just tell you, he will also point out in your life the things that are not pleasing to him in those moments too. It's like, you know, you're coming. It's just, there's a lot of pride, Tracy, that you need to set aside. There's a lot of insecurity that you don't need to walk in. Your, your, your identity is in me. You know, sometimes it's, it's, I mean, I'm just giving examples, but he will meet you there. We also see that in Paul's life, he delights in this transaction. This, this idea that you can pour out your heart to God and that um, you can receive grace and strength for everything you're walking through and that you will find a deep contentedness in it. That's the model we see here. In fact, it's, the, it's the, what we're encouraged. This is just one example. Paul talks like this, and all, all the apostles do, actually. The scriptures just are full of this. Actually, so are the Psalms. <laughs> the scriptures just full of this, where we pour out our hearts to God, receive from him, and then can delight in the, in the, uh, the knowledge that God is with us, even if we don't understand everything about what's going on around us. And then the sixth thing is repeat. <laughs> just repeat. <laughs> Go back and humble yourself. Go back and, and reframe your struggle. Say, oh, well, this is what I'm walking through. Pour that out to God. Receive from him what you need. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. It's been the theme of my year. And then repeat. Take it to Jesus. So the culture will tell you that you're strong enough. You're good enough. You got this. And in some ways, that's true. We're so capable of things. God has, we literally bear the image of God. There's so much creativity and good and grace and wonderful things that we are capable of doing. But at the end of the day, when the stuff of life really hits, I've got to tell you, you're not going to have what it takes. But Jesus has way more than you will ever need. Team, would you come? I just want to take some time to just... Stop yelling at you. I can't promise I won't do it again, you guys. It just is what it is. 
This message has, uh, that's probably why I'm yelling, but this message has changed my life. It's been true of my whole life. And no matter how deep the waters get, which, you know, maybe as, just as you get older, <laughs> maybe things just hit different or get harder or you just have more experience, whatever it is. But I'll just tell you, this is just, in, even in the small things or the large things, this is, this, these principles have just never stopped being true. That when I rely on him instead of myself, I find everything I need. But I have to choose it. So take some time this morning. I want you to consider your situation. Like I said earlier, all of us are coming from somewhere different. All of us are walking through something. Some of you are just like, I'm living my best life right now. I, I don't even know. Just tuck this away. I don't know. I just want to tell you, by the way, also, your best life is still to come. But that's maybe a message for another day. I'm working on another series about that. Have you been trying to be strong enough to be enough? You've been struggling, you've been striving, you've been trying to do all of the things by yourself and you have forgotten to take it to Jesus. Friends, it's like I, it just happens so much. It's just it's so easy to do. Don't walk in shame about that, but this is your moment to be reminded to come back. Have you been honest with God about your struggle? Are you a little nervous that if you tell Jesus what's really going on with you, even though he already knows, that you really were honest with him that your faith might break apart. It might deconstruct right before your eyes. I gotta tell you, it won't. Will you trust him with your heart? Take down those walls. Believe that he's gonna meet you with grace and power. Even if your circumstance doesn't change, you'll have what you need for today, for tomorrow, for the next day. Can we trust him like that? I don't know what that looks like for you. I'm just going to invite the team to, to just lead us in whatever they're going to lead us. Invite the team to lead us just so we can have a moment with the Lord this morning because I know he is speaking and I know he's saying to each one of you something unique to your situation. We prayed before we came this morning. We prayed as a team this morning as we gathered that the Holy Spirit would do exactly what he intended to do this morning in every person's life. We prayed for you. Whatever that is, whatever is needed, let's stand together. I want to tell you that um, Pastor Ethan and Pastor Aaron are, are here, and if you want someone to pray with you, just come and find them. But if you if you want to use this this space around the front to just come and, and pray on your own, that's open. You come and find one of us if you want someone to pray with you, that's fine. But otherwise, we'll just allow you to use this space if you want to pray. You can pray right where you are, but at any rate, just ask yourselves these questions. Invite the Holy Spirit to say to you and do in you, you pour out your heart to him, whatever it is that needs to happen in this transaction. So that church, we would trust Jesus with our whole lives. Let's take some moments with the, with the Lord and invite him to do this work in us.